Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first event of a series of events that we're having um, that's a part of the 1973 Phyllis yeah, like Wheatley Poetry Festival 50th Anniversary Prologue Community Dialogues on Historical and Literary Methods in Creative Works. My name is Dr. Tiffany Caesar. I am a visiting Mellon Scholar at the Margaret Walker Center. And I've had the opportunity to work with some wonderful people in Mississippi concerning cultural heritage and preservation. One of those wonderful people is Lauren, <laughs> who helped me put this wonderful event together with Dr. Lumumba and Dr. Luckett. So I just wanted to say that this event um, is sponsored by the Mississippi Humanities Council, um, as well as other affiliate organizations and institutions, including the Eudora Welty House and Jackson State University. So I just wanted to spend some time just letting you all know what are these events and why we're doing them. Um, in 1973, Margaret Walker invited a cohort of black women writers to Jackson State University to honor Phyllis Wheatley, the first black person to publish in the United States. Amongst those women were Alice Walker, Nikki Jingle Bonney, Sonia Sanchez, R.G. Lord, and the list goes on and on. In 2023, we have the 50th anniversary coming up. And we wanted to just do a little, I say, we want to blow a little wind <laughs> so people can feel that we're coming um, in 2023. And we have two of our lead organizers and directors of that event, Dr. Lumumba, as well as Dr. Luckett, who are here to talk about Eudora Welty as well as Margaret Walker and their particular writings on Mega ever. So throughout this week, we're gonna have events in which we're gonna be merging history, creative arts, as well as literary arts, arts in honor of what happened in 1973. So in that particular event, there was history, there was creative arts, and there was literature all in one place. And so we're hoping that through these particular events that we're having at different cultural heritage spaces, that we can emulate some of that same energy that happened in 1973. Lauren? Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. And um, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Caesar and to the Margaret Walker Center um, and JSU for partnering with us on this event. Um, we're so incredibly, um, we're just gl glad to host this event at the Welty Garden. And hopefully we can do many more events with the Margaret Walker Center in the future. Um, I also wanted to introduce one of our speakers today, Dr. Ebony Lumumba. Dr. Ebony Lumumba is Associate Pro Professor of English at Jackson State University, where she chairs the Department of English, Foreign Languages, and Speech Communications. She received her PhD in English Literature from the University of Mississippi, her Master's of Arts in English from Georgia State University, and graduated magna cum laude from Spelman College with a Bachelor of Arts in English. Dr. Lumumba is an active scholar and an avid supporter of education and the arts. She was named the 2013 Eudora Welty Research Fellow and her scholarly writings on Welty and race have been published in the Eudora Welty Review, Teaching the Works of Eudora Welty, and most recently, New Essays on Eudora Welty, Race and Class. She serves on the National Advisory Boards of the Eudora Welty Foundation and the Mississippi Museum of Art. She is the founder of Mothers Obtaining Justice and Opportunities, a nonprofit organization that supports mothers pursuing undergraduate and graduate degrees, and the owner and principal artist of Aura Elise Designs, a line of stationery and original art that lifts the likenesses of black women and girls. Dr. Lumumba is happily married to her kindergarten classmate, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, Honorable Mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, and the couple has two unbelievably adorable daughters, Alake and Nubia. <laughs> And I would like to take the time to introduce Dr. Robbie Luckett. 
Dr. Robert Luckett received his BA in political science from Yale University and his PhD in history from the University of Georgia. A native Mississippian, he returned home where he is a tenure professor of history and director of the Margaret Walker Center and Cofo Center at Jackson State University. His books included a collection of essays, Redefining Liberal Arts, Education in the 21st Century, published by the University Press of Mississippi in 2021, and a monograph, Joe T. Patterson and the White South Dilemma, Involving Resistance to Black Advancement, also published by the University Press of Mississippi in 2015. Robbie is an advisory board member for the Mississippi Book Festival, and he serves as interim president of the Board of Directors of Common Cause Mississippi, and as secretary of the board for the Association of African American Museums. In 2017, Mayor Chokwe Antar Lumumba appointed him to the Board of Trustees of Jackson Public Schools and now serves as its secretary. In 2018, he received a W.K. Kellogg Foundation Community Leadership Network Fellowship for his work in racial equity. Robbie has three children, Silas, Hazel, and Flip. And I also would like to add that he's a wonderful director of the Margaret Walker Center, <laughs> mentor, and social that. activist <laughs> that does so much as far as expanding the legacy of Margaret Walker at Jackson State University and in the world. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, so before we um, start with the questions, I just want to say that afterwards we are asking that you all stay just a little bit longer to do um, surveys um, about your experience as well as asking you to do a media release form so that we can share this footage and pictures online and for archival purposes. Thank you so much. So I will begin with the first question. So the first question for you all is what inspired you to study Eudora Welty and or Margaret Walker? Me first. Good afternoon. Is it morning? It's still morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here, uh, and it feels so apropos to be in the garden. And so hopefully we are invoking both women's energy and spirits as we discuss their work. Uh, do we? Do you want us to read the works as well at some oh, point? Yes, yes. So, uh, maybe start with an answer. Okay. As I try to control the, <laughs> the narrative. <laughs> so what inspired me to study Welty? I, I really felt that she was drawing me to her from age 12. And that was the first time that I heard why I live at the PO. And it was in her voice. It was a, an actual record on a record player that my English teacher at Chestnut Middle School, uh, Ms. Linda Allegreza, played for us. And I didn't know anything about Welty at that point. But I heard that story. And in that story, in those characters, um, Papa Daddy and all of them, I heard things that I recognized. Right? like characters and people that I recognize from my own family and from small dysfunctional towns and, <laughs> and the like, Stella Rondo and, and that whole crew. And it made me very, very uh, literally thirsty to want to know more and read more about people that were like us, Southerners, Mississippians. And her voice was so drawing too. I love women with baritone and, and deep, rich tones in their voices. And so I, I wanted to know more and I started to read her work more after that and uh, learned that she was from right down the street and had grown up here and how she uh, had crafted her career. And then I kind of lost touch with Welty's work throughout uh, high school and even undergraduate. But then when I got to Georgia State University, I took a class from Pearl McKinney which was uh, the Eudora Welty seminar. And I was the only black person in that class, the only person from Mississippi in that class. And so <laughs> by virtue of those facts, I felt that I had some responsibilities, all right, in that space. And one, Jackson belonged to me in this Atlanta classroom. I was gonna correct everyone, professor included, you can ask Pearl, about what Jackson was and, and how it was configured and what it meant. And um, it was in that course that I became more drawn to more of her nonfiction and her photography because again, I saw people that I recognized, I read people that I recognized and 
um, despite the differences in identity between myself and Welty, we were connecting through her pieces, specifically the nonfiction and the photography, which is where I spend most uh, of my time in her work. And uh, so I'll round this out by saying, in my doctoral program, I applied for the Welty Fellowship. Thank you. <laughs> Foundation. Uh, I applied once, was rejected, re applied, and I got a letter from Suzanne Mars. And the gist of that letter was apply again. And I did. And I spent the summer of 2013, which it was kismet, because we're here talking about Maker Evers and Margaret Walker and Welty. And that was uh, the, what, the 60th, 50th anniversary? of uh, his assassination and so there were all of these events and I was spending every day downtown in the archives and with her papers, what she had written about him, what she knew about that time period in the city and then going to all of these uh, commemorative events. And so I think I realized at that point that Welty was not gonna leave me alone <laughs> and um, that I couldn't put her work down, that it wasn't in Morrison's words, her stories were not those that we could pass on, uh, especially in establishing uh, the narrative about who we have been, who we are, and perhaps who we will be as Jacksonians, as Mississippians, and certainly as women writers. Hard to follow uh, Ebony Lumumba. Uh, no, <laughs> your brilliance. Um, so I'm a civil rights historian by training, and when I came out of graduate school, my, my work as a historian had been looking at the movement in Mississippi and particularly white resistance to the movement, but I would say a kind of a pretty traditional, um, you know, civil rights, political, historical narrative of what I was uh, interested in and writing about. And then I got out of grad school and was offered a job at Jackson State to be on the history faculty and to direct the Margaret Walker Center and found out that we also had all of Margaret Walker's personal papers, one of the largest collections of a black female writer anywhere in the world. Uh, and so as a historian, when you stumble into an archival collection that's like that, it's hard not to be drawn into uh, the, the study of this remarkable woman and her life and times. And the thing that I came to realize over the years that's helped me so much with my scholarship and kind of how I, uh, how I considered the civil rights movement and what constituted civil rights activism is that while Margaret herself was reluctant to describe herself as an activist, she very much was. And the result of her work and her scholarship, her art was very much activist statements. And the more you learned about her, the more you realized that she made indelible contributions to the movement, including being at the forefront of the Black Studies Movement, which evolves out of the civil rights and black power movements. And as you study her life and, and, and learn how she came to Mississippi in 1949 on a one-year appointment at Jackson State, she had a young family. She was already a world-renowned poet. Uh, she had published For My People in 1942 with Yale University Press and won the Yale Younger Poets Prize. But she had a young family, she needed a stable job, and she started teaching. She got the appointment at Jackson State in 1949. She was a, an avid journalist, a diarist. She kept a diary for 60 years. It's uh, somewhere around 13,000 handwritten pages in our collections from the 1930s to the 1990s. We've digitized all of them, you can see them all. Um, we also have our archivist here, Miss Angela Stewart, that, who would be happy to help you if you wanted to come actually research in the journals themselves at the center. But I mention them because when she moves here in 1949, she comes on a one-year appointment and she writes in her journals about how she has decided to leave her family in North Carolina. Her two oldest children stay with her husband and her two youngest children move in with her parents in New Orleans. And she comes to Jackson, Mississippi, this world-renowned poet with an advanced degree by herself in 1949. And if you understand civil rights history, a uh, world-renowned artist, black female scholar moving to Jackson, Mississippi in 1949, this was not the most hospitable place. And she wrote in her journals that she hoped she'd be able to stay maybe two years, you know, eventually bring the family to Mississippi. And she stayed 30 on the faculty at Jackson State and spent the rest of her life in Jackson, living from uh, 19, here in Jackson from 1949 to the day she died in 1998. In fact, her house, when she moved to Jackson, her, her home was on Gine Street. And if you Google map it from where we're sitting right now, it's exactly four miles away. 
four miles away from where we are we are sitting um, right now. And about five years after, five or six years after she moved into Guyon Street, <coughs> Medgar and Merle Evers moved to Guyon Street and become her neighbors. <coughs> Just a few houses apart. She lived on the same street as Medgar. She, of course, was deeply impacted by his life, his legacy, and of course his assassination. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, I wanna read uh, some of her diary entries from the days surrounding uh, his assassination in a little bit. Uh, but you understand that, you know, she knew the context within which she was living and working and recognized that she had contributions to make, even if she didn't kind of declare herself to be an activist, she had contributions to make to the society um, in this state and in this city um, that certainly promoted a more equitable world of social justice, human rights, and, and civil rights. And as a civil rights historian, that has greatly informed how I conceive of the movement itself and, 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 and broadened my definition of what constitutes activism and just has made me that much more kind of interested and enthralled in, in, in Margaret and her legacy and this whole story of, of Margaret Walker, Eudora Welty, and Major Evers. So um, thank you so much for sharing how you encountered these wonderful scholars. Also, I, I, I share this you know, spiritual connection to the people, the women I study. I feel like I'm always pushed. Like there's something um, spiritual, something extra pushing me towards that particular study. So um, I just wanted to say um, we have the poem Micah, as well as the story by Eudora Welty. If you don't have one, they're at the um, they're in the back in the table. Right now, we're going to ask Dr. Lumumba and Dr. Luckett just to read excerpts of both those pieces. So I will read just an excerpt uh, from "Where Is the Voice Coming From?" Welty published this in 1963. Uh, the same year of the assassination of Medgar Evers. And at this point in the story, for those of you, who, and I know a lot of you <laughs> in the audience, so I know that you've read this several times, but uh, at this point in the story, for those of you who lack the context, I wanted to get to the point of the assassination and what is going through the mind of the narrator, which it is written through the lens of the assassin uh, who commits this crime. And in the story, the character, the Megger Evers character is Roland Summers. And uh, this is not Jackson, as far as we know. It's Thermopylae, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. <coughs> never seen him before, never seen him, him since. Never seen anything of his black face but his picture. Never seen his face alive at any time at all or anywhere, and didn't want to, need to. Never hoped to see that face and never will as long as there was no question in my mind. He had to be the one. He stood right still and waited against the light. His back was fixed, fixed on me like a preacher's eyeballs when yelling, are you saved? He's the one. I'd already brought up my rifle. I'd already taken my sights. And I'd already got him because it was too late then for him or me to turn by one hair. Something darker than him like the wings of a bird spread on his back and pulled him down. He climbed up once, like a man under bad claws, and like just blood, could weigh a ton, he walked with it on his back to better light. Didn't get no further than his door and fell to stay. He was down, he was down, and a ton load of bricks on his back wouldn't have laid any heavier there on his paved driveway, yes sir. And it wasn't till the mid minute before that the mockingbird had quit singing. He'd been singing up my sassafras tree. Either he was up early or he had never gone to bed, he was like me. And the mocker, he stayed right with me, filling the air till come the crack. Till I turned loose of my load, I was like him. I was on top of the world myself for once. I stepped onto the edge of, the, of his light, there where he's laying flat. I says, Roland, there was one way left for me to be ahead of you and stay ahead of you. 
by dad and I just taken it. Now I'm alive and you ain't. We ain't never know, never now, never going to be equals. You know why? One of us is dead. What about that, Roland? I said. Well, you seen to it, didn't you? I stood a minute just to see would somebody inside come out long enough to pick him up. And there she comes, the woman. I doubt she'd been asleep because it seemed to me she'd been there, been in there keeping awake all along. All along. It was mighty green where I skid over the yard getting back. That nigga wife of his, she wanted nice grass. I bet my wife would hate to pay her water bill or, burn, or for burning her electricity. And there's my brother-in-law's truck still waiting with the door open. No riders. That didn't mean me. You know, um, for Margaret Walker, living on the same street as Medgar Evers, um, but also working on the same street, because the NAACP offices to this day are right beside the Jackson State campus. And after Medgar's assassination, his funeral procession will come in Jackson, right down the middle of John R. Lynch Street, right at Jackson State. Margaret's children were friends with Medgar and Murley's children. We have a, a picture of them uh, in front of uh, Medgar and Murley's home. Uh, in the yard playing together, right? Um, uh, Margaret and Murley were in the Gine Street Garden Club together. We have this beautiful picture of them at the at the Garden Club, um, having punch and pedophores like you can imagine Eudora having <laughs> here, right? Um, and, and, and so you can imagine that Medgar's assassination for her was deeply personal um, and, and tragic. When he, the night he was uh, assassinated, uh, on June 12th, 1963, Margaret actually wasn't in Jackson. She was in Iowa where she was finishing her PhD, her dissertation, um, as part of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her dissertation would become the great novel Jubilee, um, the story of her very real grandmother and great grandmother living from slavery to freedom, a book that would be published in 1966, three years after Medgar's assassination the same year as the Meredith March Against Fear, when Stokely Carmichael and Willie Ricks will coin the term Black Power in Mississippi. The single largest one-day protest in the history of Jackson happened in downtown Jackson. And so she's away, and she's at Iowa working on Jubilee, this, again, activist statement um, of a novel that will launch a genre of fiction that will come to include uh, Roots, Beloved, the, the neo-slave narratives. Um, and she's writing in her journal the day she finds out. She finds out the next day. It's Thursday, June 13th, 1963. Um, and she finds out, she was writing in her journals, and she finds out that Megger has had just been assassinated the day before. And she, I just want to read you, before I read um, Micah, I want to read you some of the excerpts of what she was writing that night. The demonstrations for Negro rights were in full swing in Jackson. And I got much material for poetry and an article, but yesterday morning came the worst news. Medgar Evers, our neighbor and NAACP field secretary had been shot and fatally wounded as he stepped out of his car midnight Thursday. By 2 a.m. Wednesday, he was dead, shot in the back, leaving a young widow and their small children. The worst tragedy of the whole movement for equality to the deaths at Oxford and the death of Lamar Smith and Brookhaven and now Medgar Evers, tragic and overwhelming in its horror. Now, if ever there was a time to write and speak out for Negro freedom, it is now. Negroes in the country are in an uproar, the whole country, not just the South. And yes, at last, we dare to be articulate and express our militants in the South. Negroes everywhere are not only ready, but demanding justice freedom, liberty, equality, fraternity, the watchwords of the French Revolution are the words of Negroes today. We are all part of a world revolution, but we are also in the midst of a tide of revolt that is only one of the, his one of the historical imperatives of the moment. This is the hour and the time. Time and tide wait for no man. This is the tide and now is the time. The full tide of the Southern Revolution for Negro freedom is now sweeping over America. What Martin Luther King hoped to do, and yes, what Medgar Evers hoped to do, now seems to be started. The conscience of America, better thinking America, and men of goodwill is truly aroused. The general belief of, in gradualism and everything in time, in due time, 
is behind, is being thrown out, being thrown out of the window. Negroes want full rights and right now, not tomorrow. As one newspaper article says, this is tomorrow. I've written an article that is both a tribute to Medgar Evers and an expose on the whole Mississippi story, but I dare not print it now. I have written it now, I, I dare not print it now that I've written it. My family would be in danger and there might uh, be all kinds of reprisals. I seem to be too vulnerable, too fearful, and too cowardly. This is a demoralizing conflict for me. This is what she's writing the day after Medgar's uh, assassination. <clears throat> um, ultimately, um, and, and you can see her grappling with it. And, and, you, and if you think about it, for the choice you have to make for your family, and we know the things that uh, Medgar Evers had to do to prepare his children for what might be the, you know, the, the tragic outcomes, in, including preparing them for what to do at night if they heard gunshots and, and, and those kinds of things. And, and, and these parents, and Margaret as a mother, having to take this into consideration that before she could write anything, right? But you could see, feel um, her pain uh, and her anguish, but ultimately she does write. And she will write a book of poetry called Prophets for a New Day that will be published in 1970 and will be a tribute to civil rights martyrs. And she used biblical prophets um, as metaphors for her civil rights martyr. And Micah was her metaphor for Medgar Evers. And her poem, Micah, is my favorite um, of her poems. And I will read that now. Micah was a young man of the people who came up from the streets of Mississippi and cried out his vision to his people who stood fearless before the waiting throng like an astronaut shooting into space. Micah was a man who spoke against oppression, crying, woe to you, workers of iniquity, crying, woe to you, doers of violence, crying, woe to you, breakers of the peace, crying, woe to you, my enemy, for when I fall, I shall rise in deathless dedication. When I stagger under the wound of your paid assassins, I shall be whole again in deathless triumph. For your rich men are full of violence and your mayors of your city speak lies. They are full of deceit. We do not fear them. They shall not enter the city of goodwill. We shall dwell under our vine and fig tree in peace, and they shall not be remembered in the book of life. Micah was a man. Thank you, Dr. Lumumba and Dr. Luckett for reading um, those excerpts. I have chills just from hearing the excerpt of the story and then um, also Margaret Walker's journal entry and poem. Um, I'm, I'm also struck at how beautiful her journal entries are um and Eudora Welty wasn't a diarist but she was um she wrote many 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 thousands of letters and her letters are also very eloquent and beautiful um and I know when I'm writing in my diary I don't my writing's not like that at all <laughs> um so Tiff, uh, uh, Tiffany and I are going to ask some questions and then we'll also open it up to audience participation too if, you, if anyone has a question as well um so I'll just start off there, those, you know, the poem and the story are uh, in very different tones, very different styles, um, different genres, and if you could speak a little bit about the significance of these works in, the significance of where is the voice coming from in Welty's larger body of work, and similar um, also with Margaret Walker's Micah as um, in her larger body of, of fiction and poetry too. So situating where, where's the voice coming from uh, in Welty's larger canon and her cosmology, if you will, of work, um, it is very much different and also very much like other things that she wrote. So the difference here is if you look at the original manuscript, which is in, housed in the archives, the date on it is two days after the assassination. And so I don't know of another piece in Welty's repertoire that was written out of that immediate emotion, sort of a reaction to something that had happened so immediately. Now, she very often wrote about what she experienced in people when she worked for the WPA and her photography, some of it matches up with some of the stories and the nonfiction. Uh, you find characters that perhaps are these people that she took pictures of. She 
even when she was younger and uh, one of her, her former college roommates, the time that she spent uh, at their home, you get elements of stories that come out of that experience. And so it's sort of left up to us to connect the dots because she doesn't do it for you um, for the most part. There are very few images that she admitted that this is that person. I am writing about the person that you see. So she wrote about her experience. That is how this story is, a, is like her canon. But it is different because it comes out of this hot frustration and this emotion over what has happened uh, to Megger Evers. So just two days out, she starts this manuscript. And you can imagine what is remarkable to many and certainly to me is the precision and the accuracy in this fictional story for what actually happened and who the assassin was just two days. So this is before law enforcement has uh, really lifted a finger to uh, try to establish any sort of justice. This is before any court case. This is well before many of the newspaper articles have been published that she is sitting down to write this piece and has so much accuracy. And um, we can talk maybe a little bit later about what that's owing to, but you see in her editing of this original manuscript, a similarity to what uh, Robbie's talked about with the apprehension that Walker feels about what she can publish now in fear for her own family. Wealthy's well, well, not necessarily, uh, it doesn't seem that she's positioned in fear, but um, there's some backtracking you know, editing that happens in the writing process, but we know that this editing has everything to do with how real and how current and right now the situation is. I um, mean, so I've got some notes from when I, I was in the archives almost 10 years ago now from that story and the titles of the story that were discarded that she kind of scratches out and thinks through uh, some of those titles. It ain't even July yet. Voice from an unknown interior, from the unknown, a voice from a or the, she going back and forth with that, Jackson interior from my room. Where is the rocket coming from? Try finding who heard me, find me, ask me what my name is. It was me. Then she goes to just me. Try and find who you heard. You don't know the one. And so we see these titles. It's almost that she wants to point folks in the right direction and what is fascinating there is that she has an idea of the direction just from conversations perhaps that may be that may uh, be happening in middle class white Jackson and what people seem to know that and they never said anything and she certainly couldn't have gone to a police precinct or you know call a hotline to say I you know I think I know even a character kind of mock-up of who this might be so she wrote it in a story, which is pretty terrifying because the story is published just a couple weeks later. Now it's published nationally. It's in a made up town called Thermopylae, which is another kind of breadcrumb uh, that she drops. Mississippi was supposed to be mentioned and it's not uh, in the story. Ross Barnett's uh, legal practice was supposed to have been mentioned and it was taken out of the story because it was just too close to home. And so this, this story sticks out in her canon as one it seems that she felt compelled to write, uh, not, in the, not as a crusader, and we'll perhaps talk about that, that essay a little bit later, uh, Must the Novelist Crusade, but to do what she couldn't have done, what nobody could have done or seemed willing to do think through this vile process and this mindset to think through it and to kind of establish what's my proximity to this as a white person in Jackson, Mississippi. I want to think through this hell and process it for myself and in the, in the process also force other folks like me to process this and think through this as well and, and establish what your proximity is to this. How much of this is you? How much of this are you, not as the government, but responsible for and allowing this mindset to exist and feeding it and hearing certain things and never saying anything. And we all know 
how this turned out. So many people knew so much for so many years. And so um, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. So when Medgar is assassinated, I mentioned that Margaret was at the University of Iowa uh, working on her dissertation and um, uh, this book, Jubilee, that she had spent 30 years researching and, and reflecting uh, on and would finally be published in 1966, three years uh, later. She's busy, right? She, she's working full time as a professor. Actually, when Jubilee gets published, the president of Jackson State wouldn't even let her leave for a book tour. Um, he, she had to stay and keep teaching. Um, he wouldn't let her go, which is a whole nother story. Uh, if you want to study Jacob Reddick's, you should read Margaret Walker's journal entries about <laughs> Jacob Reddick's. Uh, <laughs> not always kind. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and so it's not, so she's got this fear, she's got this reluctance to publish um, uh, because she knows what it could mean. You could literally be killed as a black person in Mississippi for saying any, for speaking up in any kind of way. And she just watched her neighbor be assassinated in the driveway on the street that she lives on. And the street that's named for her today, by the way, if you ever um, go there, Margaret Walker Alexander Drive. Um, and so, you know, she has her hands full, would you believe? Um, and she's sitting on this. And by the time we get um, to, and, and you look, and even if she had been able to, had written something and wanted to publish it, there is some question about whether or not as a black woman publishing about Medgar's assassination, that anybody would have picked it up and run it. Um, who knows what her access to a press would have been in 1963. And, you know, um, so she's, she's got a lot going on. But by the time uh, Profits for a New Day comes out in 1970, she's founded the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People in 1968 at Jackson State, the Margaret Walker Center today. Um, one of the very first black studies programs anywhere in the world at Jackson State in 1968, the year San Francisco State is often credited with having the first black studies program. She's doing that same work uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. The year Dr. King is assassinated three hours up the road in Memphis. She's doing that in Jackson. And by 1970, she's hosting the National Viative Conference on Black Studies some of the, and a number of other of the, the leading uh, inaugural conferences on the topic of black studies at Jackson State. And in the midst of all of that, she publishes Prophets for a New Day. And, and the poem that you heard has a tenor and a tone that is very much reflective of the era of 1970, right? The, the era of black power. Um, it, is, it is tinged with, with uh, a militancy, as she was saying in her diary in, in 1963, um, and, and an anger that is very explicit. And she does um, you know, express that in, in an incredibly clear way. And so by the time uh, the poem itself comes out in 1970, it, it reflects this period of time that she's had to think and reflect. I think it reflects the work she's been doing in the academy uh, and around black studies. It reflects her experience with Jubilee and it reflects generally the evolution of the modern civil rights movement itself and how we go from uh, what is seen as kind of the era of nonviolent direct action evolving more into the, the tone and, and tenor of the, of the black power movement. I think all of that is found there. You know, part of what I, I think is interesting here too that I, I, I'm fascinated by, and I, I don't have the, the answer to, maybe there are some people here who can help set, shed some light on this. You know, I, I mentioned it first off that we're four miles from Margaret's house. Certainly Eudora Welty knew who Margaret Walker was, even in 1963, right? Uh, but they didn't talk, they weren't friends. That may not be shocking in the era of intense segregation. It would only be later in life that they became friends. Uh, in, after kind of post 1970s, and they become um, such uh, popular speaking buddies. There was a, a speaking circuit, um, and uh, Carolyn Brown uh, said in her biography of Margaret Walker said she and Eudora called it their sister act because they were all, always on the on the road speaking uh, together at various events and functions. And we have beautiful pictures of Margaret Walker here in, in the home, right? Um, but in 1963, they lived four miles apart, and they weren't able to talk. Or, 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 or think this through together, or as is there a greater liver? Are, are there two greater living writers in Jackson, Mississippi, in 1963 than Margaret Walker and Eudora Welty? No, no. <laughs> it's, it's not even close, right? Um, and and what that even if they 
you know, if they, it crossed their minds to think about it. I wonder what Margaret thought when she first read Where's the Voice Coming From? Maybe she certainly could have felt that, you know, in a, in a very searing kind of way. So anyways, questions that I don't necessarily have answers to, but I think it's <laughs> something important for us to think about how these two women were so close physically um, from each other, um, but also had, you know, little to no connection in, in the moment of it. And, and kind of why it took Margaret so long to get to the point to publish Prophets for a New Day and Micah and what that reflected in her own kind of career trajectory. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoy this conversation about proximity. It really goes into um, our next question as we think about their differences as well as their similarities. Um, I just want to acknowledge the audience again and just say thank you for coming. We are hoping that the sun stays still for a moment. <laughs> um, but at least it's not raining, so we're grateful for that. So um, how do Eudora Welty and Margaret Walker backgrounds contribute to the way they write about Megger Evers as we think about their intersectionality of race, class, and gender? And I believe Dr. Luckett and Dr. Lumumba, you've already kind of talked about it, but if you can expand on that a little more. And in thinking about proximity, um, socially, spiritually, and geographically of Megger Evers and um, to Eudora Welty and Margaret Walker, how would you think that that inspired their words? <laughs> so, I think I would go back to before Welty really became a writer. When she was, she was a photographer first, um, and a very skilled photographer, yeah. you know. And it just kind of points me to this, this envy that you get for her. She's very good at things that people want to be good at. Reading her letters and notes to friends, they're so eloquent and funny and witty, and I mean, my text messages are very goofy. <laughs> Misspell those sorts of things. And so when she's a photographer, what makes her good um, is her eye and sort of the way that she sees um, what's there in a different way than someone else standing in her same shoes in her same position. Um, she saw dignity where there was poverty um, and perhaps strength where the assumption was that this was a weak community, these were weak individuals, they were suffering in a way that was their fault. Uh, and so her photography to me doesn't evoke that, it, it evokes just the opposite. And um, that bled into what she explained as to how she wrote characters, wrote, she wrote people. And so she doesn't write about Megger Evers. Roland Summers is not the center of this story. It is this um, white, blue collar class assassin and his frustrations. And so she is imagining uh, through a lens that is a, a little bit in closer pro proximity to what she can think through, what this must have been like, which to me is, is one of her most brilliant moments, to think two days, and of course she was thinking about it, I'm, I'm pretty certain immediately, but to put it down to paper, uh, just two days later, what was going through the mind of the person who did it? Who else was thinking that, right? And not only to do that, but to say, what's going through the mind of this person that I've encountered before, not the actual, right? And I'm not by her deal, deal but someone like him. I've encountered people who have these frustrations, who would do something like that. I've read this rumor about, um, let's see, what was his name? Big Red? Yeah, so Goat Dykeman is in the story is based on Big Red Heydrich, I think his name was. He was uh, in the penitentiary and saying, you know, let me out and I'll go shoot James Meredith, which he doesn't dignify him by calling him his name, out of school, out of the University of Mississippi. And so she's, not only is this just a common narrative, these are things that she's had the proximity to hear first person, first person. She's witnessed people, so she writes people. Right, and what she is writing is this representation of um, what she has witnessed. So there's an authenticity there that is terrifying. Um, but again, I can imagine that this is a grappling with, uh, how can I imagine something like, something this vile, this treacherous, so 
easily and so accurately. Um, and so in writing a story like this, it jibes with her, her style in that she was an observer, she was a keen observer of people. Toni Morrison talks about her, her keen, like ever searching eye. And if you read little notes, things that she never published and things that she did, her fiction to her nonfiction, there are all these representations of how she saw things and what she noticed. And so she might look at someone and wonder about uh, where their sweater came from and then imagine this whole story about a family of warlocks passing this sweater down and it having, you know, that was her uh, really remarkable imagination. But again, it was something that she had seen. There is this, um, there are these doodles in her notes at the archives where she saw something in town and I focus mainly on how she witnessed black life and almost became a voyeur uh, throughout the city to it, going to Ferris Street, uh, going to uh, certain ch church events that were in the black community. And she would describe what she saw and it's, there's this one moment where she's driving through uh, the, the black part of town at the time on Easter Sunday. And so she notice, notices all of these colorful outfits and she's looking, she looks at the men's suits and starts to describe them as birds. And she draws this little, uh, it's a little sketch of a man in a zoot suit, which white women, men were not wearing zoot suits, right? In this time period. And so she talks about the colors and how they look like birds and how this must have something to do with freedom. And it, it, I mean, it gets a little uh, bothersome and problematic <laughs> because these are her own musings and she's writing from her honesty and her, and her truth in that moment. But one of the things that it does convey is how keen of an observer she was at what she experienced. So some of the things that I've argued with other colleagues is that you know, she, everything that she writes, every person, every character that she creates came from an actual real experience. Now we can't speak to the depth of that experience, right? The reason she doesn't, I mean, she doesn't know Margaret Walker because there are other, Margaret Walker had other things to do yep. in the 60s than to come and meet your door wealthy, right? Like she's wondering whether or not I can publish what I'm feeling or if I will be killed in my driveway like my neighbor three or four houses down. She didn't have time to have tea with wealthy, okay? Yeah. But um, she does observe. So she doesn't, and she, she admits, I did not have black women as friends when Alice Walker asks her that because of the times. When was, the, when was there the opportunity to meet, for me to have this intimate relationship with equity on an equal playing field with a black woman? It didn't exist. So I'm not going to say that I'm writing these black women because I was so close to them. I'm writing what I saw. And if these were real people, then their real experiences live out through the way that she observed them. And so the very glimpse that we get of Maker Evers in this story is what she saw of him, just like the assassin in the portion I read, he saw him on television. He'd never seen him in person. And I wonder you know, how disturbed that might have made Welty that I also only saw him on television. I never got to talk to him. I never saw his face. We didn't interact like that. And what kind of closeness does that establish for me and this assassin who also did not know Roland Summers or Megger Evers? So that's a digression, but that's kind of where my mind goes. I, I think that's really beautiful the way you described that. And I think a lot of what you said about Welty and how she's able to write, where's the voice coming from with rooted in her own experience with her whiteness and her southernness and 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 and, and the, the the key character being the assassin i think you said the same thing for margaret walker how she's able to write micah is from her experience with her blackness her her the alice walker notion of womanism the 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 intersection the intersectionality of of her being a woman being black being a mother um all of those experiences and how she was raised um, Margaret Walker's parents were very intentional about immersing her in um, intellectualism and, and, and art and knowledge. There's this wonderful story um, when Margaret is 13 years old, her father's teaching at what is today Dillard University and Langston Hughes comes to give a book talk and it's 1928 and Langston Hughes is arguably the most famous black man in the world. It's the height of the Harlem Renaissance, right? And so he's given a book talk. She's 13 years old. She's already writing some poetry. You can imagine it's pretty simple at age 13. 
Her parents want her to meet Langston Hughes and give him some of her poetry. So they make her get in line, go through the, the book signing, get a book signed, and she chickens out, doesn't give it to him. Her parents make her get back in line and do it again. Oh, no. And this time she does, and he becomes her mentor. And they, they'll be friends the rest of his life. And he comes to Jackson State. Um, we have a beautiful picture of him on campus in 1952 for the 75th anniversary of Jackson State. And Langston's going to help Margaret get her first poem published, a short piece called I Want to Write. Um, and is it 1933, Miss Stewart? 1931? Yeah. Uh, it's right, right in that era, and it's going to be published in the NAACP's Crisis Magazine. Well, her editor at the Crisis is W.B. Du Bois. <laughs> She's 18 years old. Langston Hughes is her mentor, and Du Bois is her editor, yeah. right? Um, and you can imagine the impact that those kinds of people had on her um, and had on how she thought about the world and thought about her blackness. Right and, and her position um, within the world. And so that by the time you get to Jubilee in 1966, the story of her grandmother, we have pictures of her grandma, her real grandmother and great grandmother, who are the characters Vyrie and Minna in, in Jubilee. Everything she is doing is informed by, by this experience. And uh, Lauren, you mentioned just kind of the, just the, the kind of the, the, the lyrical nature of her journal entries. That's a, a function of, you know, uh, an entire lifetime of being immersed in this world of, of language and, 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 and beautiful words. She also doodles, by the way. There's lots of little doodles in the, in the margins of, of, of the journals. Even some of these that I was reading from uh, on Medgar, she's, you can tell she's thinking about what she wants to say because she's like doodling in the, in the margins. Um, but all of it is informed by her experience as a black woman in America, right? And, and, and even her having to raise a family, right? And people ask me all the time why Margaret isn't better well known in the world today. Well, she publishes For My People in 1942, the same year she gets married and has a family, starts a family, and Jubilee in 1966. Well, in those 24 years, she's raising a family and teaching full time. Like you said, she had something to do. She, she, you know, she didn't have time to just come look, knock on Eudora's door and say, hey, could we maybe hang out? Um, you know, um, and, 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 and she was, proud to be a wife and a mother. She, she gladly made that kind of choice, even holding on to what we would see as kind of more conservative gendered notions of what it means to be a wife and a mother. But that was her choice. She chose that. Um, and everything she wrote and everything um, that she published reflected those life experiences, including Micah. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Um, just thinking about Du Bois, Eudora Welty, Margaret Walker. I'm thinking about um, Du Bois' double consciousness and how um, he talks about this particular ideal of um, black people in the U.S. living in two spaces, one um, in their culture and one in a, um, a Eurocentric society. And I feel like what Eudora Welty provides us in her story is that duality of her proximity, right, to um, this racist society, right? But also her acknowledgement and her social activism of being able to, you know, write it down and know that she had to write it down, you know? So it was it was that duality that, you know, she provides, you know? What, what is it like to be, you know, so close to an assassin, but also know the, the wrongness of it? Sure, I, I, it reminds me, and I have to give again Toni Morrison credit for this in in comparing Eudora Welty to Nadine Gortimer, South African writer. And one of the things I think both of those women did well with their writing was to indict their own community in a way that wasn't didactic, right? We're just going. I'm going to paint this picture. It is up to your moral, you, you to you know enact your your moral compass there. And so Welty certainly seems to be thinking through it, through it herself, uh, because what does it feel like? I I have this proximity to this uh, this this sort of treacherous community. Um, at the same time, I feel differently about some of the things, or maybe I should feel differently. And she even says in Must the Novelist Crusade that uh, you know it's not fiction's role or the author's role to tell you how to be or what your character should be, but I can certainly, we know that. We know how we should be. We know what the, our better selves look like, 
Now, whether or not we uh, we aspire to that or whether or not we make strides towards that, then th that's where our decision comes in. And so Welty, um, like Gortimer, um, in certain ways, like Walker, let me just show you where we are. I can certain, fiction can certainly, poetry can certainly show you yourself, hold this mirror, and then it's up to you. So I'm not gonna tell you what to do with it uh, because you know, Wellesley uh, argues that that's a collective voice and we very seldom learn things from groups, but it's these sort of int in intimate individual uh, encounters that impact us. So I think in her writing it down, really that's all she's doing. I'll write it down to think through it, to process, and to show where we are. And interestingly, Walker, her career, she spends a great deal of time not in establishing the sort of dichotomy that exists in Southern and Mississippi identity that you cannot and will not see us as one thing. So it's interesting that. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things Margaret was also very proud of was being a Southerner. She, she came back to the South to, to stay and received criticism from other black artists and writers about making that choice to be here. Why would you be in Mississippi? I mean, Medgar was assassinated on the street you live on. Are you crazy? Why are you here? Right? But she was intentional about that and make that choice. And, and the, the point you made about telling stories, to go back to Jubilee, Jubilee is a function of the stories that her grandmother told her while her grandmother was living with their family in New Orleans as she's growing up. Her parents apparently hated that she, her grandmother was telling her these stories because they're about slavery and like the, the trauma and tragedy and the, and but also the triumph of, of what it was like, but it was real and her parents are going, why are you telling her these stories, right? <laughs> um, but ultimately Jubilee is a function of her writing down those stories and spending 30 years um, reflecting on them and, 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 and researching them. But um, yeah, you know, there's just such a, a great point about that, and um, you know, the, the the commonality of that kind of lived experience of being Southern and and, and and claiming it and how that informs you. Margaret was very intentional about that too. Well, I just wanted to to open it up and see if the audience had any questions. If you want to raise your hand, I can bring you the mic. Um, does anyone have a question they want to ask? for a comment for our speakers. Kina Graham, who is the superintendent at the Medgar Evers home. She should be up here. I just wanted to know if Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander ever thought about how the Evers family would receive her work. Um, because, you know, it's, in a sense, it's, well, not in a sense. In a sense, it's about her and, and Dr. Uh, Walker's Alexander's um, journey and, and probably her beliefs and her approach to civil rights and black power, but also the subject matter is about somebody's father, husband, best friend. So um, one thing real quick before I address that, you, you most of you uh, know and have heard of Margaret Walker and also Margaret Walker Alexander. And if you, if you don't know the distinction between the two, Alexander was her married name. Um, it was a name she used professionally at Jackson State. Most of her students, most of the people around Jackson State alumni and other, other folks knew her as Dr. Alexander uh, here in Jackson. Uh, and the street is Margaret Walker Alexander Drive, um, where um, the Medgar Murley Evers home is. Um, her pen name, she always used her maiden name. Everything she ever published, she used Margaret Walker. So you'll hear us refer to both. We are talking about the same person. Um, even many, many years, obviously, after uh, she's married in 1942, she publishes Prophets for a New Day in 1970 under Margaret Walker, not under Margaret Walker Alexander. So I just want to, we, we go back and forth there. I want to make sure there's a, a little bit of clarity in that. She did think about how they would receive it um, because they were friends. Right. Um, and one of the moments that she writes about in her journals that I was looking at, and I, I should have um, brought some of the excerpts from it, is when Murley leaves Jackson and moves to California. And she writes about uh, kind of she, her sadness, and, but understanding of why she's leaving and why she's moving. Um, and so she considered that. And I've had the good fortune uh, to, to know Murley, to, to interview her. I interviewed her at length, um, almost three hours at the Margaret Walker Center about six or seven years ago. Um, and, and Rena, their daughter um, as well. Um, and, and they were, 
you know, of course they were they, they were dealing with their personal trauma uh, and, and trying to survive in the world of de dealing with the incredible overwhelming loss that they had faced. Um, but they felt deeply moved and supported by by what Margaret was saying and what and what she did. And, and and yes, Margaret was thinking about that and thinking about them. I mean, we got their kids were friends. They played on the street together, and she lived there for the rest of her life on that same street and, and had to see it every day. So, any other questions? I can come bring you the mic. <laughs> Miss Stewart, archivist at the Margaret Walker Center. Someone else who could be on this panel. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. One, being, you know, you talk about, nowadays we say she was stereotypical and old fashioned about being considered a mother and a wife. But in 1949 to 1966, being considered a, a black woman and being a, considered a mother and a wife was a revolutionary thing in Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson Public Schools decided to eliminate courtesy titles rather than have to have to call African Americans Mr. and Miss or Mrs. So being able to say I am Mrs. Furnish James Alexander, being able to say I am Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander, that was revolutionary in that time period when people were calling you either by your first name or auntie or mammy, you know, people who had no relation to you but were calling you those things. So it was a revolutionary thing. But also she had a short but tumultuous friendship with Richard Wright and she had addressed to him the idea about being an activist and he says, well, no, we're not activists in the way that, um, W.E.B. Du Bois or others who were, but we give people something to think about. We give them a base of knowledge on which to act so that they're not just out there, you know, um, flying off <coughs> the wall with no grounding. We provide them the inspiration and the knowledge for which they can be come active from she also was good friends with Sterling A. Brown. And if you ever talk to Charlie Cobb or read anything from Stokely Carmichael, you know about the inspiration. He is both a poet and English professor at Howard University, provided for activists. So it was about providing, and as my mother would say, who was a great friend with Margaret Walker, she always gave you that, you can do it, baby. You can do it, <laughs> that push. Um, so that, that's what was important. And it's why her community name meant so much because she, now she could be, she was an old fashioned woman, which meant she spoke her mind. And sometimes that wasn't the most polite way to say it or the most in touch with your feelings way to say it. But she was honest and truthful and she wanted the best for people and they recognized that and, that, and that's also what the community cherished about her. That they knew, she knew that they could do better than what they were doing and she was gonna push for that and not allow them to settle for mediocrity, but to be the best that they could be. I wanna thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Stewart, in particular, the, the mentorship part of it, Margaret, in all of those years was very intentional about mentoring a new generation of scholars and, and artists. And and you can talk to many of them today who knew her and, and were loved by her and supported and mentored by her. And the reverence that Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez have for Margaret Walker because of her intentionality as a mentor is pretty powerful. It's just such an interesting point that you make Angela about, and thank you. Her mother was my father's favorite teacher. <laughs> and thank God she told him he could do it. <laughs> um, this point about there being, there, it was revolutionary and it is still revolutionary for black women to uh, rest in these spaces that were not uh, crafted or carved out for black women from the inception of this country. That is just wife and mother, right? Those were things that black women from 1619 on had access to. Uh, and it's interesting if we think about the converse of that with wealthy 
never being married and never having children as a middle-class white woman was an oddity. She stood out there as this, there's this uh, a portion of a periodical, the Jackson Journal, uh, right at the time, which becomes the what we know as the Clarion Ledger, has an article and Welty's in the middle of it, giving some talk or doing something, and it just says Eudora Welty. But I, what I noticed around it, there, there, there were all of these other announcements about other women across Jackson and society doing things, and their names were Mrs. John Smith, Mrs. Jim Brown, Miss. None of the women's names were on the page. And there in smack dab in the middle was Eudora Welty doing some talk or, or I can't remember the activity. Uh, and it just said Eudora Welty. There was no courtesy title because what do we call her? She's this strange woman has, who has not been married and has no children. What is she doing? But I, that sticks out to me that conversely, her living the life that she lived by choice, right? It doesn't mean that she wasn't in love with people doesn't mean that she wasn't, Mary Alice is back there, that she did not provide maternal support and care for, for children. And so it's interesting as we talk about these writers and the very different lives that they lived uh, due to their identity intersections, that there are these small points that we overlook that they were shunned in their communities for uh, upholding and what they were doing really carved out a niche for women who would come after them and do uh, the work that they were doing, which women writing at for as a career yeah. in the mid-century was uh, was novel in itself, and they're actually making a career of it. So they were breaking barriers um, from opposite sides of towns, from four miles away from each other, and they finally came together for their for their sister act, and then they made a sister brother act. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question back here. Thank you. I, uh, I am curious about uh, when, when, when we were growing, growing up, there was not a lot of uh, discussion about, uh, about uh, white people backgrounds. And now that there is a lot more coming out, uh, and, and uh, with the, these uh, sudden um, concern about critical race theory and the misinterpretation and um, how, how they're they're trying to uh, define it, which of, of these um, works are going to be banned? Because there is so, so much that that could come under the umbrella that some people are trying to make of it. So could you speak to that? Collective side. <laughs> <laughs> so you are absolutely correct that there are these misinterpretations about a theory that exists at the law school level. Right, to, to invoke Judge Katanji Brown. If you are thinking critically about race, which we must do to understand this social construct that human beings have created to establish hierarchy and status and position and attain wealth and all of these things, you've got to think critically. We should think critically about everything. And so, Welty and Walker did think very critically about race. It is <laughs> critical race theory again is a, a, a law school theory that no K through 12 classroom has ever um, incorporated. But these stories are by these thinkers who are thinking about the way that they are positioned in society based on who they are. And part of who they are is a black woman and a white woman. That's certainly what Welty did. And so if we start to eliminate uh, texts that engage the process of thinking critically about how we are positioned in society based on race, we have nothing to read. <laughs>
that go, the newspaper leaves to, emails, I mean, there will be nothing. And, you know, Morrison told, there's an Africanist president presence in American literature. So if we just get down to the literary canon that exists and that was, uh, you know, inaugurated in this country, even if you're writing a story through the perspective of a white assassin, living in mid-century Thermopylae, this made up space that invokes classical literature that tells us this kind of hell is not new, which Thermopylae is a, a gate uh, to hell, one of the gates to, to Hades um, in Greek mythology. But this isn't new, what we we're experiencing. That's kind of that another breadcrumb that Welty drops, but this man's anger and rage and diabolical plan to shoot down this man he doesn't even know in his driveway is steeped in what he feels that he lacks access to, that he should have a right to, right? That he has this sort of uh, entitlement to because of race, right? So he uses the N word, she throws it throughout the story, which there's an authenticity there to the mindset of this person that the story is told through, but that story is not about black people. It is about the anger of this white man based on what he feels is being taken from him by black people. He doesn't feel ownership, or he doesn't feel rather allegiance to Thermopylae, which is supposed to be Jackson. He doesn't feel allegiance to, we read it as Mississippians as being in Mississippi, but this could be any, it could have been anywhere. Roland Summers could have been any number of mortars in the black movement, black liberation movement. And this assassin who is unnamed is unnamed for a reason because we can sub out anyone in his world. We can sub out folks who are on television today in 2022 at confirmation hearings perhaps, <laughs> or at protests in classrooms on the daily news who feel some sort of anger at another group of people for what they lack access to. So uh, again, digression. But if we start to try and categorize things and remove them because they interrogate uh, race critically, no matter who the author is, there will be nothing left to read or engage or talk about. This is always a way to think about race critically, whether the author intended that for the story or the piece or not. It's the lens of, it's the lens of the reader. So we'll find a way no matter what's removed. I, I can't add much to that. I will just note that a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure to be at the University of Mississippi and do a talk um, on critical race theory and uh, civil rights education in Mississippi. And there was a, a clip played by uh, a, a, you know, a talking head um, where he suggested that critical race theory is a fundamental threat to America. And I just couldn't help but think, how fragile is your whiteness and this nation if an, if, if an intellectual endeavor like critical race theory threatens all of America? And I said, I said at the time, it strikes me, maybe Vladimir Putin is a bigger threat to all of America right now than critical race theory. But the reality is that they want to be protected, the people who oppose this and this legislation that gets signed by the governor. By the way, I hope all of you know, the only part of it that says anything about critical race theory is the title. It says critical race theory prohibited, but the actual law says that we're not allowed to teach our students that anyone is inferior or superior to anyone else. That's all the law says. It doesn't even use the language critical race theory in the law. I think it's primarily meant to be a tool to intimidate yeah. teachers at the elementary and secondary level from right. talking about um, things that make people uncomfortable. And I had the, the good pleasure to sit in on a legislative breakfast with Vaughn Gordon um, that Mississippi Today sponsored a few weeks ago about critical race theory. And Vaughn is the new executive director of the Alluvial Collective, which is what the William Winter Institute has evolved into. It's the, the new um, Winter Institute. And Vaughn said something that I thought was really enlightening. It, it, if a student, if a child, if a young person reads Jubilee or is studying about slavery and comes home and is bothered about what they learned, maybe that's a good thing. And, and, and what he said was, maybe it means they have a moral compass, right? And, and maybe we should be encouraged that young people are bothered when they are thinking critically about this past. And as far as I know, no one has ever made a rule that says history has to be perfect and happy all the time, right? <laughs> 
Like, and, and there's no, we can't control who came before us, right? And the, there's no rule that says the people who came before us had to be good or right all the time, right? My, my ancestors, uh, there are plenty of the people who came before me who were bigots, who were white supremacists. And acknowledging that and recognizing that and learning and growing from that is something that is incredibly important and something that, that reading Welty, that reading Margaret Walker can help us do. Thank you and thanks everyone for your questions. We're just going to wrap up with one more question and I do want to remind folks that before you leave, if you can fill out that Humanities Council evaluation and just leave it on the table, we really do appreciate that. Um, and I also want to shout out Nola D. Platters, who is our wonderful caterer today for the food. Um, thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, one last question. Um, you mentioned Ebony Thermopylae. Um, and both Margaret Walker and uh, Eudora Welty referred to ancient texts. Um, Eudora uses Greek mythology references and Margaret Walker biblical references. Can you just talk a little bit about how those those references add weight and importance to their work? Um, so this is, I'm gonna try to keep brief because classical literature um, and writing about black lives in the South is my thing. Uh, it has been for a while, but uh, using, there's something, there is something restorative about affixing an identity or character to something that has the longevity and the staying power of the classical uh, mythology that we all see references to in everything, in architecture, in, um, in literature, certainly, in culture. And so when we think about, when I think about Welty using Greek references specifically, one, uh, or classical Greek references rather, one, she talks and struggles with a great deal in her work about how the South is portrayed. Uh, which is not dissimilar to what our understanding is of how we are seen as Southerners for those of us who are, which I think maybe everyone in the audience. And so we've all, we've had family members and colleagues and perfect strangers say to us, uh, you're from Mississippi. Oh, what is it like there? <laughs> right? And have these assumptions about uh, the space. And so Welty grappled a lot with that. And so to tie, uh, Mississippi certainly in the 60s, right? Jackson, Mississippi in the 60s to a space that has over time become ameliorated as the center of culture and uh, history and um, just elevated consider consideration. One kind of sheds a light back onto, you know, ancient Greek, Greece wasn't as pristine as we like to think, and the myths are just as sorted and dirty <laughs> and x-rated as they come. And so one, it is kind of disavowing the way that that culture was seen as the mark of uh, intellectual prowess and prestige by making it the South, the space that gets, that is the picture of Dorian Gray, right? Gets everything ugly and sorted and unsafely projected onto it. It also lifts this likeness of the South in making it possible to be a part of this narrative of humanity and how we move and evolve and what exists here. Everything that exists there, wherever there is, also exists here. That there are new nuances in this space that make it important. And we often see the South uh, denigrated in a number of ways, in the political arena, in cultural arenas, in every statistic, what we have to be told that we are, especially in Mississippi, the 48th, the 49th, the 50th, right? Uh, in every percentile that matters to human life. But I think that Welty was resting this notion that uh, these things exist everywhere. This could be anywhere in the world uh, that this sort of thing has happened. Do not become comfortable sleeping in your beds thinking that this is only happening in Mississippi. This is only happening in a place like Jackson. It's everywhere. And she, one of the, the analogies that she makes to a writing about emotion is that she says that hate is really the emotion that's gooey and sticky and that we can't pull ourselves out of. And so that's a universal reality. That's a universal truth. And I think she was demonstrating that 
Uh, one, we know that she could not have said it was Jackson. There were, there were safety issues for her. And also, who's going to publish this if you are, and, and it would have been presidential to the case, prejudicial to the case, that sort of thing. So there were choices that she had to make in terms of editing her, her writing and taking advice from her editors. But also, if I'm going to make a change, that change is going to matter. It is going to mean something. And so I think she's kind of, um, you know, shaking some, some statues and some idols that have been upheld, especially in intellectual and literary pursuits, in using that iconography. Uh, very uh, well said. You know, the, the point about um, being from Mississippi and, and coming to Mississippi, we have people all the time that come to the Margaret Walker Center to visit, who, uh, particularly our black visitors who are from other places, who come, will say to you, I never thought I was going to come to Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> My parents told me never to go to Mississippi, right? Yeah, exactly. Never go to uh, Mississippi. You know, for Margaret, talk about a moral compass. Christianity was her moral compass. And in those journals, they also are filled with her nightly prayers. And she's you know, writing out these, 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 these prayers in, in longhand. And, um, and so Christianity was... Her, her driving um, force uh, throughout her life. I mean, her father was a minister um, who had a, a master's degree um, from Northwestern University, right? A black man raising a family in the early 20th century with a master's degree from Northwestern and a, and a, a theologian and a, and a divinity scholar as a, as a, as a, as a, as a father. Um, I think in, in some ways, and I am certainly not a, a literary scholar or um, someone who is made his career in literary analysis, but I think in some ways her use, particularly in prophets of the day of Christianity um, and these biblical prophets um, is one, of course, very much her personal experience of, of what she was rooted in and her Christian upbringing, but also a way to say in this Judeo-Christian nation, right, that the people who would lay claim to Christianity have got it often wrong. Uh, and if you read the Bible, if you read what's in the Bible and what we know about Jesus and, and Christianity, that you would learn very different le lessons than what you're living in places like Mississippi. And, and perhaps that's what she's trying to get across in something like Prophets for a New Day um, as well. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. you, Dr. Luckett, Dr. Lumumba, and Dr. Caesar. Let's give them a hand. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we will have this recording available be posted on social media. And please stay tuned for upcoming events with the Phyllis Wheatley 50th anniversary prologue um, this week and next. And November 2023 for the 50th anniversary of the Phyllis yeah, Wheatley Poetry Festival. Yes. Um, and also we will be having a plant sale here on these grounds this Saturday. It begins at 9. Um, we recommend coming right at 9 or early because plant people are very intense about their plants. Um, so thank you all again for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.